Satan, God is good. And all the time. Yes, he is. Psalm 100 verse 5. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. And his truth endureth to all generations. I'm grateful for the gentleman who sang. God bless you. Thank you very much. Uh, who am I that Christ should bear that sacrifice for me? And that is directly related to what I have to say this evening because the subject is how low can you go? Please turn off your cell phones if you have them. I know you do so that there's no ringing of phones in God's house. You know, I prefer this as a source of Bible truth rather than a phone, but I can't force you. All right, favor number two, while I'm speaking, pray for me and seriously say to God, Father, put your words in that man's mouth. His words are life and power. My words are not. And the third favor I ask, as you heard from our good doctor, use what God has given us. Think. Let's use our brains and think as we listen. Let's pray. Our loving Father in heaven, thank you, dear God, for this privilege we have to come into your presence, right into your presence through Jesus Christ. As we kneel or we bow in your presence, dear God, if we've offended you, forgive us. On the basis of Christ's infinite sacrifice, we ask for this forgiveness. And we know you'll give it because you've promised. Grant us your spirit, dear God, because the spirit of truth alone can enlighten our minds and protect us from error. I humble myself before you, dear God. I seek only your glory and the blessing of your people. So use me effectively, I pray. Thank you for hearing this prayer. Bring others safely on their way, I ask. In Jesus' name, let God's people say, Amen and Amen. Genesis 2, verses 16 and 17. Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. A very familiar passage. The Bible says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day thou eatest thereof, finish the verse, thou shalt surely die. Now that's all God said as a consequence. What was the consequence of disobedience? Death. Did God say thou shalt surely be sick? Did he say thou shalt surely have wars? Did he say thou shalt surely have famines? But has the world experienced these things, yes or no? Yes. We have sickness. We have famine. We have plagues. We have war. We have all kinds of outcomes that God never intended. Which means that since God only said, thou shalt surely die, all these things I have listed must be expressions of a dying world. In Hebrews chapter 2, chapter 1, sorry, let's go there. Hebrews 1, we should read from verse 10. This is God the Father speaking to the Son. It's a remarkable passage in the Bible, one of the most remarkable. This is God the Father speaking to the Son. Hebrews 1, reading from verse 10. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they all shall wax old as, a, as doth a garment. So the Father is saying, the heavens and the earth, they shall perish. From the inception of sin, the world has been on a dying track. And I've heard someone say, the moment you're born, you start dying. Let me say it again. With the introduction of sin, the world was placed on a downward slope towards death. It is a dying world. And so the father tells the son, they shall perish, but thou remainest. And they all shall wax old as doth a garment. That's from the lips of the father to the son who created. And so God said, in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And earth has been dying ever since and moving to that point when it is finally destroyed and a brand new earth and a brand new heaven are made. Now let's go to 
Genesis chapter 3. Adam and Eve have sinned, verse 6 of chapter 3. They are aware of their sin and they try to intervene by covering themselves in verse 7. They hear the voice of God in verse 8 and they hide themselves. Now let's listen to what God has to say in verse 16 as he speaks to Eve. Well, let's read verse 15 first. This is the first promise of the Bible. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. This is the result of sin. Listen to God. I will multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. And thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. The reason why we have dictatorial, despotic men making life difficult for their wives is because of sin. And God announced that curse. Now, God didn't tell men, harass your wives. God has given an outcome as a result of sin. He also said, in sorrow, thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, he shall rule over thee. Now, I've never met a woman who gave birth with a smile on her face. Now, the smile comes after the birth, and she holds her baby. But during the process, I am told, I've never been in the delivery room, there is crying, and there's grimacing, and there's cursing of the husband for his contribution. All of that goes on. Because I'm told it is painful. That is a result of sin. Which means that prior to sin, childbirth would have been painless. Sin, therefore, seems to have created a physiological change in the female system. Let's look at sin again. Verse 17. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and has eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Now, God is saying sin made it difficult to till the ground. So sin has a reproductive consequence. Sin has an agricultural consequence. Sin has a social consequence because the difficulty that men create in the lives of women. Not all men, but many of them. Let's go to verse 18. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth unto thee. Sin had a botanical consequence. In the sweat of thy face shall thou eat bread. Work will now become hard. Sin had uh, economic and an employment consequence. Sin my friends, is a virus that has infected every level of human existence and of the ecology, the environment. Everything that God placed under Adam's dominion was infected by this virus called sin. Every level. Let's go to verse 9 of chapter 3. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Now, sin affected the relationship, which is the greatest effect, between man and his creator. If you read verse 19 of Genesis 2, if we go there quickly, so that what we just read in verse 10 comes into sharp focus. Genesis 2 verse 19, And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the earth and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. In other words, here was God, Adam, and the animals together. Adam wasn't running. Let's go to verse 21, also of Genesis 2. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. Now we have God, Adam, and Eve together as God performs the first marriage ceremony. There was no running. But in chapter 3, verse 8. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves. Sin 
the worst consequence is how it ruined the relationship between God and that part of creation made in his image. And so we go back to verse 19 of Genesis 3. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. Now work becomes drudgery. How many people go to work every day not because they like what they do, but because it provides rent and food and school fees? But they suffer and they wish they could do something else. Work was designed to be a delight and a method of developing the character. But God says, in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. Work now will be hard and backbreaking. And most people in the world today, they work hard. Till thou return unto the ground. For out of this was thou taken, for thus thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And so we see the various levels at which this thing called sin contaminated God's system, which was designed to function flawlessly and endlessly. In the book, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 522, not yes, paragraph 3, we read, God is a life giver. From the beginning, all his commandments or laws were ordained to life. But sin broke in upon the order God had established and disorder or chaos or anarchy followed. Sin disrupted the order God had established. And that order functioned flawlessly at every level. One sin disrupted the whole thing now all the evidences of disruption were not clear at first but as the world has gone on we have seen the effects of sin now so God told Adam in verse 19 curse is the ground for thy sake now the earth was cursed three times by the time Christ came and I'm getting to why the title is how low can you go in verse 19 because thou hast hearkened un not verse 17 because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee saying thou shalt not eat of it cursed is the ground for thy sake now let's go to chapter 4 of Genesis and the Lord God said unto Cain where is Abel thy brother Genesis 4 9 and he said I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground, and now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. Now this was another curse on the earth because of murder. The first curse announced to Adam, verse 17 of Genesis 3, because of sin. The second curse, because of Cain's murder of his brother. And God said, when thou tillest the ground, it shall not, in other words, from this point on, the point of your murder of your brother. Are you with me? Now, God had cursed the ground before. Now, the ground becomes even more difficult. Let's go to chapter 5. How low can you go is our subject. Chapter 5. We read from verse uh, 28. And Lamech lived 180 and two years and begat a son and called his Noah saying, This same shall comfort us concerning our work and toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord God hath cursed. And so by the time Noah is born, that's hundreds of years later, the people are still suffering the effects of this cursed earth. Curse for Adam's sin, curse for Cain's murder of his brother. Now let's go to chapter 8. Chapter 8, verse 20, I believe it is. And Noah built an altar unto the Lord, is that verse 20? And took of every clean beast and every clean fowl and offered what? Burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again what? Curse the ground anymore for man's sake. What curse was God referring to? Okay, here's the clue, Noah. The flood. God said, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake, for the imagination of man is evil from his heart. So God is saying, I will not do this again. That's why the earth will never be destroyed by water again. Because water destroys but does not purify. Fire does both. So we have the curse on the earth because of Adam's sin. We have, so the earth, man fell. He fell again. 
on the basis of Cain's murder of his brother. Then he fell again at the time of the flood. We have a threefold curse on the earth. When Christ came to take our place, he took on him the curse that rested on the earth as a result of sin. Let's go to Galatians chapter 3. Our subject, how low can you go? When Christ came, as I said, the earth had fallen. You see, Adam's fall was not the only fall. There was Adam's fall, then there was another fall when Cain killed his brother. There was another fall when the earth became so wicked, God had to wipe it out. We have had successive falls. I suspect the earth fell again when they said, crucify him. Galatians 3, verse 10. For as men, well, let's read 13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. Now, what's the curse of the law? All that I said is involved in the curse of the law. Because all that I talked about resulted from what? Give me one word. And what is sin? The transgression of the law. All the murder, famine, death, drought, you know, divorce, everything that plagues mankind resulted from one act. By the way, there really isn't any such thing as a little sin. No one knows the gigantic consequences that can result from a so-called microscopic sin. Let me say that again, differently. In Genesis 13, Abraham and Lot separate. The Bible says that Lot chose him all the land, the plain of Sodom. And Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. Genesis 13, I believe, verse 11. And Abraham dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot pitched his tent in the cities, of, in the plains of Jordan, and pitched his tent towards Sodom. He dwelt in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent towards Sodom. That one choice led to the loss of his wife in chapter 19, his married daughters, he had married daughters, Luke verse 13 and 14, his sons-in-law, and there can be no doubt, all his grandchildren. That one choice. Yet the Bible describes Lot as a just man, 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 7 and 8. He was a just man. For that, right, for that righteous man, 2 Peter 2 7, Vex his soul from day to day with the unrighteous deeds or the unlawful deeds. Second Peter two verse eight. He was just. He was righteous, but he made one major mistake. He chose the wrong location to set up his house, and he chose it selfishly. And that mistake had consequences that bore fruit towards the end of his life. And even the two daughters that came out with him are not described as righteous. Only Lot is described as righteous. And Lot ultimately lost his self-respect. They made him drunk. They had children with him. One mistake led to concentric circles of calamity in that man's life. Listen to me. Adam made one mistake. It was not catastrophic by the way we measure errors. It wasn't murder. It wasn't genocide. It wasn't hijacking. He picked a fruit that God told him do not eat. Because of that one mistake, this world has suffered for 6,000 years. There is no such thing as a little sin. So the Bible says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. What does that mean? The ultimate curse is death. As I said earlier, all the sufferings that we endure are all expressions of a dying world. They all culminate in death. We have a doctor amongst us. I'm sure she will agree that there's, some, there's such a thing called dying. Are you with me? He is dying. Dying ends at the discrete point called death and all the system shut. He is dying. The world is dying. A person living apart from Christ is dying. And so death and dying are the curse of the law. Because the Bible says the wages of sin is death. But our subject is how low can you go? We've established there were three falls. Three curses. The curse from Adam's sin, one fall. The curse for Cain's murder, second fall. The curse for the flood, third fall. When Christ came, Christ took all of that. 
I think of the song the young men sang. Christ took all of that on him. Why? That those responsible for the curse might have an opportunity to have eternal life. Let's go to John 19. Let me show you how Christ took the curse. The curse included not just personal sin that we commit. The curse included the effect on the environment. We go to John 19. Hold John 19. Let's go back to Genesis 3. Hold John 19. Don't lose it. Put one finger on John 19 and you'll have nine fingers left to find Genesis 3. And we shall read from verse 17 again. Well, let's read verse 18 to save time. How low can you go is our subject? Genesis 3, 18. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth unto thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. Meaning that it was never God's will that people should eat the herbs. Things we eat today, even though they're plant-based. Thorns and thistles did not grow before sin. So we're very careful how we reach for the rose. Why? Because of the thorns. Let me say it again. There were no thorns before sin. Remember the parable Jesus spoke of the man who planted and then tears came up? When he said, who did this? He said, the enemy hath done this. The enemy is Satan. Somehow Satan manipulated and produced thorns and, and life forms that God did not create. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth unto thee. Now, keep thorns in mind and thistles related. Let's go to John 19 verse 5. Then came Jesus forth wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. When Christ was hanging on that cross, what did he wear on his head? A crown of thorns. Now the thorns represent the results of sin. He was bearing our sins, not just our personal sins, but the crown of thorns represented the fact that his sacrifice also covered the natural world. Now let me elaborate because we talked about it affected the physiology of women, it affected the hardness of the ground, it affected every area, but let's be more specific. Let's go to Genesis 1.29. Our subject, how low can you go? You're supposed to tell me to slow down when I go too quickly. Oh no, no, I never asked you to do that. It was Santon, sorry. If I go too quickly, please say, slow down. And I will obey from the frontal lobe and I will slow down. <laughs> okay. I won't let that bypass and go to the limbic. I'll obey. I'll slow down. What book did I say? Genesis, what chapter? One, what verse? 29. And God said, Behold, I've given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed to you it shall be for meat. Now that's for human beings. He goes on, and to every beast of the earth and to every fowl of the air and to everything that creepeth upon the earth wherein there is life i have given every green herb for meat now god's arrangement before sin was every living thing would eat plants name some living things name a living thing a living animal a lion what do lions eat today gazelles and wildebeest and uh, warthogs that's what they eat and you if they can catch you the cheetah eats the young of the wildebeest the leopard catches the uh, i don't know the springbok the uh, the wild dog catches the the lechwe that inhabit the okavango of botswana the uh, the anaconda catches anything squeezes it to death and then swallows it whole when you look at the nature program, you see the lion, you are looking at the results of sin. God's arrangement was that lion should eat plants, that leopard should eat plants, that wolf should not eat sheep, but eat plants. Even plants eat animals. You didn't know that. Yes, you did. Even plants eat animals. Sin has just turned everything up side down and so when Christ came his sacrifice covered the natural world the crown of thorns let's go to Romans chapter 8 we'll read from verse 19 and when you see the word creature in those verses read creation 
Romans 8, reading from verse 19, our subject, how low can you go? The Bible says, for the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. What that verse means is creation is suffering badly. Did you hear what I said? The natural world suffers badly. And the natural world is waiting for those who call themselves God people to really live up to that high standard. And so the verse says, for the, the earnest expectation of the creature or creation waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God, who really is a child of God, stand up and live like one that Jesus could come and stop all the suffering in the natural world. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, was it nature that sinned or Adam? Adam, so the verse says, for the creature or creation was made subject to vanity, meaning emptiness coming to an end, disease, not willingly, but by reason of him who have subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption. Listen to what the father told the son. Thou remainest, but they all shall perish. As a vesture shalt thou fold them up. So Paul is saying now, creation shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know, verse 22, that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. We know creation is suffering. We call it mother nature. And so the Bible says nature is waiting, longing to be delivered. Now you may say, how? I don't know. All I know is in Mark 4, the very first, last verse of that chapter, I think it's verse 41, I'm going to quickly. When Jesus said, peace be still, the disciples, they were, they were, they were just, they were scared to death when he stopped the storm. And they said, what manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him, so that there is a consciousness in nature we don't understand. There are people who swear when you talk to plants, they grow better. Well, you won't catch me talking to them, but some people believe that. If you talk to plants, they grow better. Now, if a plant is covered, the plant changes direction to find the sun. Am I talking the truth? How does the plant know that? I don't know. Jesus told the Pharisees, if my disciples hold their peace, the very stones will cry out. Let's not, because of our limited understanding, limit the marvels of creation. Creation somehow. You know when Jesus died on the cross, creation knew and reacted. Earthquake, the sky went black. Creation responded to the death of the creator. No, so creation is suffering because of sin. That sin Adam committed. All of those curses... The first one, Adam's sin. The second one, Cain's murder of Abel. The third, the terrible condition of the earth that led to a global flood. All of that, the conditions in nature, the conditions in uh, uh, social interaction, all the evidences of sin, all the curses piled on Jesus. In other words, as if to say he is responsible for that. Now let's go back to Galatians 3. Let's read from verse 10. We have to take a close look at what caused the curse. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Now that may seem a little confusing. It's not. Now, remember favor number three. Think. Listen to what the Bible says is the location of the curse. For as many as are of the work, people who do things to impress God, the works of the law, are under the curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone that does what? What does continueth not mean? Listen to it. Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things or everything which is written in the book of the law to do them. Give me one word, do them. One word for that. Obey. The Bible says the curse is on those who don't obey the law. How? Everything. How? Listen to the verse. Curse is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the law to do them. What kind of obedience does God desire? 
Total obedience. The curse is on the man or the woman who does not render what kind of obedience? Complete and total. That's the curse. So the curse is of disobedience. What the verse is really saying, no one can keep the law fully by himself. But that no man is justified by the law, verse 11, in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but a man that doeth them shall live in them. In other words, God is saying, if you can keep that law, that's your life. But no one can. Except one man. Name him. Christ. Now, Christ came, lived a sinless life. A life that deserved blessing, not a curse. But took the curse from us. Now, if Christ takes the curse from you, and God is an either or God, something has to be put on you. What's that? Listen carefully. If Christ takes the curse from you, and you accept that sacrifice on your behalf, what is placed on you? The blessing. That the blessing of Abraham may come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. That we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Verse 14 of Galatians 3. Let me say it again. When Christ took the curse, anyone who accepts Christ then receives the blessing. Which is the blessing of deliverance from sin and all the good that comes from that. The same way disobedience has multiple consequences, obedience has a foundational blessing, life, and multiple blessings that flow from that seed of life, which is health, security, blessed children, God's protection, the presence of the Holy Spirit, the close protection of angels, all these blessings that flow from the seed blessing, which is life. Disobedience, death, and all that flows from the seed of death, sickness, disease, war, plague, broken homes, whatever. Christ took on him. He went low. There is no human being whose life has been so bad that Christ, Christ can't get under him. To lift him up. If Christ had come in the days of Methuselah, he would have come before the world had suffered the final, the third of the three curses. Christ came after the world had suffered three successive falls. The world was at a spiritual low. That's when he came. And he took those three curses on him. All the consequences. He took them on him. I mean he took every particle of the curse. That we might receive the blessing. Which is deliverance from the bondage of sin and all the blessings that come from that. And Jesus says to us, believe that I did this. Believe that I bore the curse for you. And if you'll believe that, I will work a change in your life. And I will remove all evidences of the curse that plagued you up until the point when you met me. Believe. And so when you and I pray, and we say, Father, in the name of Jesus, it is not just in the name of J-E-S-U-S. -S. There are many people in South America and other Spanish countries called Jesus. They simply call Jesus. So there is no magic in J-E-S-U-S -S and the black ink with which it's written on the paper. The power is in who that person is. Who is that person? God and man. Who is that person? Sinless life in human form. Who is that person? Voluntarily laid down his life. Who is that person? Raised himself from the dead. Who is that person? Conquered death, hell, sin, the grave, Satan. Who is that person? The one who said, let there be light. Who is that person? The one who sits on the right hand of the Father. Who is that person? The one who intercedes for sinners. When you say in the name of Jesus, you've got to understand what you're saying. It is because Jesus took the curse. Let me be more specific. When Christ was on the cross, the Father cursed him. 
Notice Galatians 3.13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone. Who does the cursing? God. Ah, you didn't hear me. You know, sometimes we like to soften what Christ did. We said, no, he can have done that much, so let's reduce it. Mm -mm. The Father cursed. But you see, the Bible says Christ was on that cross as a sinner. Isaiah 53, verse 11 uh, verse uh, 12, he was numbered with the transgressors. Let me say it again. Christ died as the greatest sinner in the history of the world. Because he took how many sins upon him? All sins. When the father looked, he saw a sinner. The ultimate sinner. And the father turned away. And released Christ to the forces of hell. And put his curse on him. For you. And for me. Now, if we believe that with all our hearts, we have accepted the foundation for forgiveness, the foundation for blessing, the foundation for admission to God's kingdom, and the reason to love Jesus with all our heart and soul. And so the Bible says in 1 John 4, 19, we love him because he first loved us. When we see what Christ did, what he took that we should have taken, that generates in us a love for him. And because of that love, we don't want to repeat what put him on the cross. And what is that? Sin. And so we begin to hate sin. All sin. When the Bible says the wages of sin is death, it didn't say the wages of big sins. It said the wages of sin. Not only in 25-year-olds and 60-year-olds, the wages of sin in a 10-year-old is death. The wages of sin in a healthy, smart teenager, 14, is death. Because sin resulted in the greatest catastrophe in the universe. That was what happened on Calvary. But Calvary is a coin with two sides. You know, heads and tails. Heads, the love of the Godhead for humanity. Tails, the dragon's tail of hatred and envy and animosity towards Jesus Christ. How low did Christ go? No one could have gone lower. So there is no one who can say, my situation is so bad, Jesus does not understand and cannot help me. We cannot say that because Christ scooped up from the very bottom of the barrel of the sewer of this earth. And anyone who comes to Christ will find in him the full and sufficient payment for his or her sins. And that is what Christ offers to us. You accept my life. Because I took your death. Let me say it differently. We should have been on the cross. We should have been sweating great drops of blood in the garden of Gethsemane. We, not Jesus. You know, when David heard that Absalom had died, you know what he cried and said? Oh, that I had died in thy stead. I wish I could have died instead of my son. And a genuine Christian will think of the cross and say, Father, I should be there, not Jesus, but love. That's why the love of God is so mysterious. Love worked out a plan that not even the angels understand. They don't even understand. How was it possible for God to save sinners and still remain a just God, satisfying the demand of the law for death? Christ, Hebrews 2, 9, he tasted death for every man. And yet every man won't be saved because every person does not accept that sacrifice. But tonight I'm asking you, contemplate the fact that Jesus went as low as he could possibly go. He was born in a stable with animals, animal dung all over the place, animal urine. That's where he was born. No one can say, Christ does not understand, as I said earlier. And so tonight I ask you from my heart, as the Spirit of God also speaks to you, accept that sacrifice for your sin and mine. Any sin you commit, God forgives. Any sin I commit, God forgives. Because there's no sin so great, it cannot be covered by that terrible sacrifice that Jesus made. There is no sin God does not forgive and cannot forgive. It is fully paid by Jesus. All we have to do is confess, 
You confess to God holding on to that cross. Are you with me? You wrap your arms around the feet of Jesus. You say, Father, from this position, I ask you to forgive me. And the Father must forgive. Because you're bringing to him the eternal, infinite sacrifice of his son. Because of this, you can forgive. It also tells us how sacred God's law is that someone equal with the Father had to give his life. An angel couldn't die for us. The life was not precious enough. And for a second reason, the life of an angel does not belong to the angel. You missed it. The life of an angel belongs to Christ as creator. But Christ's life is natural to him. So he alone could give his life. Are you with me? He, as the Bible says, at the grave of Lazarus, I am the resurrection and the life. John eleven twenty five. 25. I am the resurrection. I am life. Not I have life. I am life. And so when Jesus died, he gave his life. An angel would have given the life Jesus loaned. Are you with me? And so only Jesus could pay the full price. Your life. His life. For yours. Accept that sacrifice. And let God change you. And remember, give me one word that brought the curse. Give me a bigger word. Disobedience. Why do lions eat gazelles? Sin. Don't give me a scientific statement. Sin. Are you with me? The gospel is simple. Why do men rob and steal? Why do anacondas suffocate animals and then swallow them whole? Why do mosquitoes kill more people than any other animal on the face of the earth? Sin. Why do we have the cough, the cold, the sneeze, whatever? Sin. Why are we so short? Sin. The Bible says we shall grow up as calves of the stall. Malachi 4.2. Why is our thinking so corrupt? Sin. Why is it hard to admit I'm wrong? Sin. Why do I see sin in others never in me? Sin. Why can't I forgive people? Sin. Why is there a strike in South Africa every two months? Sin. Why is there unrest? In Ukraine, sin. Venezuela, sin. Thailand, sin. You name it, Syria, sin. Why is that people don't get along, get along on the church board? Sin. But the sacrifice of Christ is the answer for that. Will you not say tonight, Father, thank you for arranging that impossible sacrifice. Thank you for sending your son to take the full curse, the full curse, that I may participate in his life. Let me say it again. Thank you, Father, for sending your son to take every piece of that curse on himself that he may give to us every piece of his life a human being can take. And so the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5 17, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. And in verse 21, God he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. What a tremendous exchange. Here's righteousness. Give me sin. Tonight, give your life to Christ. Believe that his price covers anything you've ever done and can ever do. And that on the basis of that sacrifice, God accepts you fully. Shall you not say tonight, Father, thank you, thank you for the sacrifice. And give me a heart to avoid the thing that led to the curse. What is that? And what is sin? Help me to obey and distance myself from disobedience. Anything God tells you, say, Father, help me to obey. Anything God tells you, I want you to take a risk on God. All business people take risks. Am I right? Yes. Take a risk on God and God will never let you down. And the risk is do whatever he says. Take a risk. Take a chance. God says, prove me. Take a chance. So, Father, I'm going to accept that sacrifice of Christ. Now you move in my life. Show me. Accept it fully, and God will respond. So how many will say tonight, Father, thank you for the sacrifice of your son, and I accept it with all my heart tonight. Hands up. Stand with me. Even if you don't fully understand all the ins and outs, all you know is that Christ paid the price for sin. That we may not have to suffer. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father in heaven,
Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his sacrifice. Thank you to God that he became a curse. You cursed him that you may save us. Father, all of eternity we will spend trying to understand the depth and the height and the breadth of this remarkable arrangement. Give us a hatred for sin, dear God. That thing that led to the curse that resulted in Calvary. Sin, which is disobedience to our God's law, his voice. And Father, while every head is bowed, every eye is closed, I make this call, dear God. Let your spirit touch hearts to whom it applies. If there's a man or a woman listening to me, having heard what I said about how Jesus suffered, how he took the entire curse, every bit, and the reason for that was sin, disobedience. If there's someone and you know you are actively living in disobedience to God in some area of your life, listen to me carefully, in some area of your life you are actively, willfully, and deliberately disobeying God. And you'll say tonight, Father, I lay down my stubbornness and I want to obey you in that area where I have disobeyed. If that is your decision, can you raise your right hand? Someone, you are actively disobeying God. Actively. And you know it. And you want to say, Father, tonight I want to stop. And I surrender my stubbornness. Give me the mind of Christ that I may obey you. Just raise your hand and leave your hand up. Dear God in heaven, register these hands. Please, register them as hands that have surrendered to you. And that are willing to obey you by your indwelling power. Forgive them, dear God, and let them accept your forgiveness. You are God who forgives and does not remind us of our sins. But from tonight on, dear God, let the sacrifice of Christ be the basis of the power in their lives to resist disobeying you in any area of their lives. Help us in the hours we have left tonight, dear God, of conscious living to walk uprightly with you. Help us to avoid doing anything that brings back to Christ the sensation of pain that he felt on Calvary's cross. Fill our hearts with hatred for sin and a love for righteousness. And we thank you that Jesus went as low as he can go so that he can save everyone who comes to him. Take us safely, dear God. Bring us back tomorrow night to hear your word again. I offer this prayer with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Let God's people say amen and amen. God bless you.